Hello and welcome. I'm Kelly Weiss, Executive Director of Marketing and Communications at the UC Davis School of Law, and we're happy to see you all here for the continuation of our Racial Justice Speaker Series. Wanted to give a quick overview of the format of today's lecture. We will have a brief introduction from Dean Johnson and we'll go on to our, our lecture with featured speaker. And after that, we will take questions through the chat. You can send those questions to me and I will then ask them and we can move through our Q&A in that way. This is being recorded and we will um, have it available on our website after our event. And if you have requested MCLE credits for this talk, um, you will receive an email with information about that following the event. And with that, I will turn it over to Dean Johnson. Thank you and welcome everybody to UC Davis Law School's Racial Justice Speaker Series. Today's lecture is co-sponsored by the School of Law, the UC Davis Aoki Center for Critical Race and Nation Studies, uh, the Global Migration Center, and the Chicano Studies Department. A couple of years ago, as protests over police brutality and systemic racism swept the nation, uh, UC Davis School of Law reaffirmed its commitment to racial justice. In beginning the 2021-22 academic year, um, the law schools offered this racial justice speaker series, examining some of the most urgent issues facing our nation and world today. And as we know from recent events, uh, the discussion of racial violence uh, continues to need to take place. Now the series has gathered leading voices on civil rights, criminal justice, and civic and governmental responsibility. Our goal is to inform, enlighten, most important, engage in meaningful conversations with our community and the larger public. Now for this event today, we, we have over 240 people who've signed up on Zoom. We are very lucky, privileged to have Kelly Lytle Hernandez, Professor of History and African-American Studies at UCLA. She holds the Thomas E. Lifka Endowed Chair in History. Uh, Professor Lytle Hernandez is one of the nation's leading experts on race, immigration, and mass incarceration. She has books on the history of the U.S. Border Patrol and the rise of incarceration in Los Angeles. She and her books have won too many awards to mention here, now, but, but I will mention one. In 2019, she was named a MacArthur Fellow. Now, today, Professor Lytle Hernandez will talk about her latest book, Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands. It's a book written for the general public to inform the general public. Now, one of the reasons we invited Professor Lido Hernandez was that the co-director of the Aoki Center, Raquel Adana, heard Professor Lido Hernandez discussing her book on NPR and suggested that we invite her. The book is amazing and I recommend it to you all and we'll hear more about it as we welcome Professor Kelly Lytle Hernandez. Thank you, Dean Johnson. It's really wonderful to see you. Um, we're old friends and colleagues and co-conspirators, and it's always a, an honor to be in your presence. Um, of course, thank you to the, to the law school and all the co-sponsors of this program. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk briefly about the book, and then we'll open up for a conversation. And that's where things always get the most interesting. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Give me a second. Okay. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to provide a short overview of the book and particularly tell you why I think this story about a group of Mexican revolutionaries is really important to US history. And then I'll take you back inside the book and we'll go a little bit deeper um, with a few stories from the book. So you ready? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a resounding yes, you all are ready. So this book, it, Bad Mexicans, it tells the story of a group of um, Mexican dissidents who fled Mexico in the early 20th century to incite a revolution against the dictator back in Mexico. That dictator's name was Porfirio Diaz. 
And the dissidents were known as magonistas, that's how historians um, most often know them. But they were disparaged by President Diaz as bad Mexicans. And that's where the title of this book most directly comes from. Um, the Magonistas crossed out of Mexico and into the United States into Laredo, Texas in January of 1904. And within days of arriving, they noticed that they were being followed everywhere. And they knew, knew that those were Diaz's spies. So they moved first to San Antonio and then St. Louis, where they relaunched their rebel newspaper, Regeneración. They established a political party, El Partido Liberal Mexicano, the PLM, and they even started an army. And in 1906, this PLM army raided the small town of Jimenez, Mexico in Northern Mexico. They raided out of Texas. And that raid, it's really important to note, stoked fear not only within the Diaz regime in Mexico, but across the United States as well. Now, why would that raid on Mexico cause fear in the United States? Well, by the early 20th century, um, the United States and some large investors in particular had a major stake in Diaz's Mexico. US citizens owned a quarter of the Mexican land base and dominated key industries from railroads to mining. And these investors, these US investors in Mexico expected Porfirio Diaz to protect their investments. And the Jimenez raid suggested that he could not, that a revolution was coming to topple him and perhaps US investments in Mexico. So following the Jimenez raid, the United States government worked very closely with the Diaz regime and a bevy of spies to stitch together what I call a cross-border counterinsurgency team to suppress the Magonistas movement. And in time, I'll speak about it in a moment, we can think about this cross-border counterinsurgency team as the beginning of COINTELPRO, which we learned about in the 1960s and 70s. Um, between 1906 and 1910, however, um, the U.S. Departments of War, Justice, State, Labor and Commerce, U.S. Marshals, Immigration Agents, um, Police and Sheriff's Deputies, and more, all worked with the Diaz regime to either extradite, deport, or imprison hundreds of magonistas across the borderlands. However, this cross-border counterinsurgency campaign did not work. The rebels persevered. They outran and they outsmarted the border counterinsurgency team. And so by 1910, the Magonistas had organized four armed raids on Mexico from Texas, and they incited the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican Revolution, the world's first so social revolution of the 20th century. And so this book, Bad Mexicans, tells the story of the Magonistas revolt and of the US Mexico counterinsurgency team that failed to stop them. Now it's a pretty extraordinary tale. It's cinematic, it's riveting. It's got tyrants and spies and secret codes and armed battles and love affairs and betrayals. It's got everything that you need um, for a great book, great spy story and a great film. Um, but that's not why I'm telling the story. Um, most often the story of the Magonistas is told within the context of Mexican history. And in fact, the Magonistas and the PLM are legendary in Mexico. They're known as being the precursors of the Mexican Revolution. Um, towns and streets and gyms and schools and buildings are named after Magonistas in Mexico. And in fact, in 2022, on the centennial of um, the death of the leader of this movement, a man named Ricardo Flores Magón, the Mexican government declared to be 2022 to be the year of Ricardo Flores Magón. Despite their legendary status in Mexico, the Magonistas are very little known here in the United States. Um, when their story is told, it's often told within the context of Mexican American history itself, which is often seen and treated as tangential to the US story, at least the core threads of the US story. So what I wanted to do with this book, um, Bad Mexicans, is document how the Magonistas in particular, Mexican American history in general, actually strikes at the heart of the American story. So let's talk really briefly about how the Magonisa story um, does that. So the Magonisa story um, is about a rebellion against a dictator in Mexico, but that dictator's reign grew under the wing of US empire. In fact, US imperialism took its very first steps in Diaz's Mexico. 
So as you all probably recognize this um, image, the United States government spent the 19th century charging across the North American continent in search of new lands for its white settler citizens to occupy. Ginned up on the fantasy of manifest destiny, um, the arriving Anglo-American settlers um, backed by troops fought to extinguish indigenous land claims. Um, and by the mid 19th century, the US settler state also branded the white man's republic began to seriously consider a new kind of expansion that's economic and political domination without territorial acquisition. This form of expansion, imperialism, began in Mexico under the rule of Porfirio Diaz, a legendary military general who seized power in Mexico by coup d'etat in 1876 and ruled Mexico with an iron fist until rebels put him out in 1911. So bad Mexicans in the revolution against Porfirio Diaz as iron fisted um, dictator is also a story about US imperialism and the rise, the birth and rise of it in Mexico. So during his reign, Diaz invited foreign investors to buy land to extract resources and use labor without directly assuming control of territory or governance in Mexico. By 1900, US citizens, including everyone from one pick miners to Edward Doheny, William Randolph Hearst, the Rockefellers, they owned a, over 130 million acres of Mexican land, amounting to a quarter of the land base. By 1910, of all money that US citizens invested abroad, fully one half of it, $500 million, was invested in Mexico. And people like William Randolph Hearst wondered out loud, I really don't see what has prevent us from owning all of Mexico and running it to suit ourselves. So this is the story of how a scrappy band of Mexican dissidents exiles in the United States are able to organize a revolution that not only challenges Porfirio Diaz, but also the rise in power of US imperialism. Now the rise of US imperialism um, or what some call the integration of the US and Mexican economies, also displaced millions of Mexicans and ignited mass migration from Mexico to the United States. The violence of the Mexican Revolution of 1910 accelerated that flow. So that by the 1920s, Mexican immigrants would become the primary low wage labor force across the American West. And by the 1980s, Mexicans had become the largest immigrant group arriving in the United States ending Europe's long dominance in the US immigration story. And by 2010, more immigrants had arrived from Mexico than any other country in US history. Today, Latinos led by Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants constitute what some people describe as the largest non-white population in the United States. If so, by 2045, the United States is projected to be a quote, minority white nation with Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants leading this shift. In other words, what's important about this story is that the rise of US empire and the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican revolution are seminal events, not just in Mexican history, but also in US history. These are events that changed who we are as a people and we need to begin telling the story within the canon of US history. And third, Mexico's labor migrants were not America's immigrants and their arrival in mass at the beginning of the 20th century, importantly, opened a new field of race and inequity in the United States. Now, since the US-Mexico War, Anglo-Americans had largely regarded persons of Mexican descent as a conquered mixed race Mongol population slotted by manifest destiny to serve the settler citizens and fuel their industries or to disappear. Migrating from job to job across the American West, Mexico's labor migrants built the region's industries while running head first into a web of white supremacy that's built on a bedrock of anti-Blackness and Jim Crow. They confronted low wages, dangerous working conditions, segregation, racial violence, and a racially biased immigration system amounting to what some historians now call, quote, Juan Crow. In fact, um, this book about a revolution in Mexico begins with a lynching in Texas in November of 1910. That lynching sparked um, revolt across Mexico 
as people decried the violence that they were facing at the hands of Anglo-Americans, both in the United States and in Mexico, as all those US investors built up businesses and subjected Mexican immigrants to dispossession, uh, Mexican citizens to dispossession and to Jim Crow conditions in the workplace within Mexico. So they revolted and began to call for the removal of Porfirio Diaz from power. Porfirio Diaz tried to suppress their uprising, but it was too late. By November of 1910, the Magonistas and others had sowed the seeds of mass revolt in Mexico, and neither Mexico nor the United States would ever be the same. So for these three reasons, I argue in this book, um, the Magonistas and Mexican-American history are at the center of the U.S. story. So now I want to go a little bit deeper into the book and tell you a little bit about some of these rebels. Labrador Rivera, you see here, was a school teacher. He was a reserved, learned man. He never said much. He was often the quietest person in the room. His friends nicknamed him El Fakir for his quiet, ascetic manner. One of my favorite of the rebels is Juana Belen Gutierrez de Mendoza, who was a cross-dressing autodidact from the mountains of Durango, who became a vocal advocate for minors. She was arrested numerous times and under jail forms, she would sign her name, quote, sedition and rebellion. She would go on to join Emiliano Zapata's rebel forces and co-write Zapata's manifesto, um, El Plan de Ayala. There's also Antonio Villarreal, a literature professor who wants to time in Mexico um, for killing a man in a dispute, um, in a literary dispute in particular. But the center of this rebellion was a man named Ricardo Flores Magón. He was a journalist who looked more like a, a girthy professor um, than a revolutionary. He was charismatic, but vitriolic. And he edited a newspaper called Regeneración in Mexico City, in which he dared to print the words that nobody else would. Um, he wrote things like, General Diaz has killed democracy. His rule is authoritarian and despotic. Um, he has turned Mexicans into the, quote, servants of foreigners. This was um, revolutionary text in um, Mexico City, in Mexico, when nobody would directly name Porfirio Diaz as a tyrant or as a dictator. Um, Ricardo Flores Magón, however, did dare to do so. And he told the general public that if you don't understand this as a dictatorship, someone who's been in power for more than 20 years, the reason why is because the government press is a quote, social intoxicant that perverts public opinion, making us think that our absolute monarchy is a democratic republic. Very quickly, Porfirio Diaz began to suppress um, Ricardo Flores Magón and his fellow rebel writers in Mexico City, had them arrested multiple times, had their printing presses smashed. Um, <clears throat> and Diaz um, suggested to them through rumor that they stopped their rabble rousing. And they wrote back, quote, we are not revolutionaries, but we will be if Diaz's tyranny does not stop. Now, for these words, um, Diaz had Flores Magón arrested again numerous times, and he also had a gag order issued against him in 1903, so that neither Ricardo Flores Magón nor any of his colleagues could print a single word anywhere in Mexico. So in early 1904, Ricardo, Liberado, Antonio, Juana, and several others fled Mexico and went to the small border town of Laredo, Texas. In Laredo, they settled among the large number of Mexican immigrants being dispossessed and um, pushed out of Mexico um, and Mexican Americans in South Texas, a region of the United States known as the Brown Belt, um, and began organizing to relaunch Renacion from north of the border. But as I mentioned before, within a weeks of arriving in Laredo, they noticed that they were being followed everywhere, and they knew that those were Diaz's spies. So they moved to San Antonio and then St. Louis and then began living on the run as fugitives. Still, by 1906, their collective had relaunched Regeneración, established the PLM, and recruited an army. And in June of 1906, following a deadly labor strike at an American-owned mine in Cananea, Mexico, the PLM publicly vowed to launch an armed revolt across Mexico within one year's time. In this manifesto, dated July 1st of 1906, they announced that the revolt would, among other things, protect voting rights of Mexican citizens, establish a minimum wage, prohibit child labor, eliminate, eliminate debt servitude, 
and probably most importantly, return land to families dispossessed by Diaz and foreign investors. Alarmed by this PLM plan, President Theodore Roosevelt ordered the US Department of War to quote, go to the utmost limit in proceeding against these so-called revolutionists. They had one year to shut down the Maconistas revolution. Throughout 1906 and 1907, the borderlands were on lockdown with soldiers, with US marshals and vigilantes on patrol, ready to thwart any revolt that threatened US investments in Mexico. Still, the PLM army recruited among cotton pickers, among miners, among migrant workers living in the borderlands was ready to fight. And on Je September 26 of 1906, Juan Jose Arredondo, a grandfather who had lost his land when Diaz came to power, led 60 PLM fighters in a pre-dawn raid on the small town of Jimenez, Mexico. By noon, the PLM fighters had locked the mayor and the official, local officials in the jail and declared Jimenez to be free from Diaz's rule. But when the PLM army rode out of Jimenez to free the next town, someone opened up the jail and the mayor called the nearest garrison. Soldiers tracked Arredondo and the PLM soldiers across the borderlands, killing one during a shootout at a nearby hacienda. But most of the rebel fighters made their way back um, across the border to the United States which they thought would be safe harbor, but they were wrong. Infuriated by the raid, Diaz sent Mexican spies to infiltrate the PLM and ordered Mexican consular officials to work with US agents to arrest, to extradite the court or kidnap as many Magonistas as possible. The regime also hired a spy, Thomas Furlong, um, to hunt down Ricardo Flores Magon and the movement leaders. Now, Thomas Furlong, you see here, was a scrappy spy man from St. Louis, imagining himself as America's Sherlock Holmes. He hustled contracts from the Pink Pinkertons and was always seeking bigger opportunities at every turn. One of Furlong's most significant contributions to this cross-border counterinsurgency campaign against the Magonistas was his penetration of the U.S. postal system. He planted spies or he hired spies to open the rebels' mail copy their letters, and then return the letters to the post, hoping the Magonistas would not notice that their correspondence was being stolen. The Magonistas did notice that their letters were arriving violadas and began writing in ciphers and secret codes, sending every letter through at least five intermediaries to keep their plans and their locations secret. So here you see on the screen, one of the rebels secret um, coded letters that they sent to one another that was stolen by Furlong's men. Furlong cracked their codes and used the Magonistas stolen letters to chase them across the United States, Mexico, and Canada. They arrested Juan Jose Arredondo and the Jimenez Raiders across Texas, holding them for extradition. They deported Magonistas from Arizona, the very first mass deportation of Mexicans in US history. And they used the stolen letters to track Ricardo Flores Magón and other movement leaders everywhere. In August of 1907, Furlong tracked Rivera along with um, Antonio Villarreal and Ricardo Flores Magón to a shack at the edge of downtown Los Angeles. With several detectives from the LAPD, Furlong spies kicked in the door and brawled with the rebels for nearly an hour before knocking them unconscious and dragging them through the streets of downtown LA to the local jail. The rebels spent the next three years in prison in the United States which is where US and Mexican agents expected them to die, taking their revolt with them to the grave. But in fact, the Magonistas revolution only grew while these rebel leaders were incarcerated. Now, how did it grow? I'm sure some of you already know the answer. Women. <laughs> Women like Maria Brousset and Conchita Rivera, Librado's wife, held the movement together. Now, Brousse was Ricardo Flores Magón's life partner, and she smuggled letters to and from Ricardo in jail. How did she do this? Well, she would drop off clean clothes to him at the jail, saying, I'm his wife. I'm here to do my womanly duty of, of his laundry. But in the seams of his pants and his underwear, she had sewn rebel correspondence and notes. Ricardo would pick up his clean clothes, pick the notes out of the seams, and then sew his own rebel correspondence back into the clothing and wait for Maria to pick up his dirties. Furlong's men figured out this ruse and caught many, but not all, of the rebel letters 
And when they did not see when Ricardo, and they did not see when Ricardo slipped Maria a note one day during visiting hours, Maria flipped her skirt over the note, slipped it into her purse, and delivered it to a PLM safe house in Los Angeles to a man named Praxidus Guerrero, who read the note, which included Ricardo's call for a new set of arm raids on Mexico. Praxidus immediately left Los Angeles and put this plan for the new set of raids into effect. Now, who was Praxidus Guerrero? Praxidus was a very unlikely magonista. He was born into a wealthy family in Guanajuato. He grew up with private tutors and writing poetry and winning equestrian competitions. But as a young man, he renounced his family's wealth and moved to the United States to work as a migrant laborer. He met a PLM recruiter in the mines of Southern Arizona and immediately joined the organization. And he emerged as an eloquent and powerful writer of the organization. Now, some of the more famous quotes of the Mexican revolution can be tracked back to Praxis Guerrero. Um, and one of the things about this is that Ricardo would write these diatribes. They're very hard to quote from because they're more than a page long. They're very dense. But Praxidus really perfected like the Twitter feed of the early 20th century. And he would write things like, if you believe that you will not reach freedom by walking, then run. So a small seed of rebelliousness, and you will reap a harvest of freedoms. Justice is neither bought nor requested as a handout. If it does not yet exist, it is made. And probably most famously, he wrote, it is better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. And this would go on to become one of the more famous um, rally cries of the Mexican revolution. Um, so with Praxidus at the lead and Ricardo Flores Magón in prison, in June of 1908, the Magonistas unleashed three stunning and lethal raids across Northern Mexico, making the world wonder if Diaz's days were numbered. Now remember the PLR army is an army of the dispossessed. It's migrant workers, it's cotton pickers, it's immigrant workers across the United States, namely in the borderlands with just a very few guns and even, maybe even fewer um, bullets and just a couple of horses, they unleashed these raids across Northern Mexico. And just a few days after these 1908 raids, President Roosevelt and the US Attorney General instructed the newly established Bureau of Investigation to crush this Magonistas revolt, to seek out and arrest and imprison or more all of the Magonistas that they could find across the borderlands. Thwarting um, this revolution became the job of this new federal police force, the Bureau of Investigation, which would be go, go on to become the FBI. This is why I say that we can see the, the origins in COINTELPRO here in 1908 with the beginning of the FBI and its efforts to suppress the outbreak of the 1910 Mexican Revolution from here in the United States. Um, ending the Mexican Revolution before it could start was the F one of the FBI's very first big cases, in fact. So there was a swirl of arrests following the 1908 raids. Maguanistas were swept up across the country and imprisoned in Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary. But it was too late. The Maguanistas by 1908 and heading into 1910 had already sowed the seeds of insurgency and Mexico was en route to revolution. So in November of 1910, not long after the lynching of a young man named Antonio Rodriguez, um, in Lynch in Texas um, had incited riots across Mexico. This is when the Mexican Revolution officially began. Ricardo Flores Magón and the Magonistas did not lead the major battles. The PLM's ill-provisioned army lacked the resources needed to lay siege to Diaz. Ricardo Flores Magón, released from federal prison in the United States in 1910, also lacked the will to shift from agitator to military general when the time came to fight. An anarchist, Ricardo believed that Mexico's aggrieved masses would spontaneously, spontaneously rise up and storm the dictator's palace once the PLM set the stage for revolt. He was very wrong about that. Francisco Marrero, Francisco Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata, and others were the ones to take the Mexican Revolution through its fighting phase. But it had been Ricardo Flores Magón and the Magonistas who had opened that road to revolution in Mexico. To do so, they thrashed against the interlocking cords of empire, of white supremacy, and capitalism in the United States at the dawn of the 20th century 
and they forced some of the world's most powerful people to contend with the dreams and the demands of Mexico's dispossessed. In this way, the Maguanistas made history. And they did it on both sides of the border. And while there are legends in Mexico, it's important that we in the United States also know their extraordinary tale. Not only does the Maguanista story of revolution from the borderlands make clear how Mexico and Mexicans are central to US history, but their motley band of mi migrant workers, including intellectuals, cotton pickers, farm workers, miners, and more, played a major role in defining the world in which we live by defying the world in which they lived. So thank you very much for listening to this quick overview of the book. And I look forward to uh, the conversation I'm going to have about these early 20th century revolutionaries in the borderlands. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. And as you said, we'll now get to some questions. Again, you can send your questions to me and I will pose them. I have one from uh, an alum of ours, Eduardo Diaz. Uh, thank you, Eduardo, for sending your uh, thoughts here. He mentions that um, just as a note that we can think of that um, given Professor Lytle Hernandez um, economic uh, ties to the US economic and political expansion in Mexico and the uptick in Mexican immigration, that this would be um, excellent history to be reviewed with our law students engaged with the immigration law clinic. So we'll keep that in mind. And he also recommends mob violence against Mexicans in the United States, the strangest fruit in historical context. And that's by William D. Kerrigan and Clive Webb. And he says the strangest fruit is the name of an exhibit of the work of Vincent Valdez about Mexican lynching and a contemporary aesthetic. And I should mention that Eduardo is with the National Museum of the American Latino. So uh, just some thoughts from him. And um, Professor Lionel Hernandez, is that anything that you've, you're familiar with, The Strangest Fruit, or something uh, might be of interest? Sure. Well, as I noted, this book actually begins um, with a lynching in Texas in 1910 and makes the argument that, in part, you know, we often talk about immigration as an escape valve, right, or a release valve that when people come, become frustrated or it's impossible to make their way one way or another um, in their home country, they then leave <clears throat> and that releases pressure, right? The issue here though, right, is that yes, Mexicans flee Mexico, but when they arrive in the United States, they run into that web of white supremacy, which is most powerfully punctuated by the racial violence that they confront um, in Texas, but elsewhere with lynchings being the high point, um, the most um, violent manifestation of that, that um, of white supremacy, that web. And so when they run into that web of white supremacy where there's no escape, what do you have left? You have revolution, right? And that's this group of migrant workers that the Maguanistas are recruiting from are people who see no options. Immigration is not an option because it just lands you into the lap of, um, of the beast of white supremacy. Um, and so they organize to rebel. So that's absolutely a, a major part of this story. Great. We have a question from Zoe who writes, how does the imagery of the bad Mexican continue to influence current perceptions of Mexican immigrants and undocumented peoples? Well, I think obviously, in part, this book's title is a play on Donald Trump's um, disparaging remarks when he was running for office of bad hombres um, and his attempts to stir up fear um, against immigrants to strengthen his own campaign. And so this is very much a, a part of the it's part of the legacy um, that we're grappling with. And one of the things I wanted to do with this book was and, you know, historians respond very slow politically. We got to get into the archive. We got to write. We don't, you know, publish an op-ed just that night. But in some ways, this book is a response to the bad hombres um, rhetoric and wanting to make clear the kind of violence that he was tapping into when he used that language to disparage Mexican immigrants. 
The issue is, as in the former question, very few people know the history of anti-Mexican lynching in the United States. Very few people know the history of, of Juan Crow. And so it's important that we make plain what he was stirring up against Mexican immigrants or Latinos in, in general by using that kind of rhetoric. And this book, in part, is that process of making clear, making plain, making public um, what he was tapping into. Um, so this is an unfinished story, right, in terms of racialized marginalization and, and rhetoric that stirs up um, violence. But it's also an unfinished story in terms of us being engaged in movement and revolt. And so, yes, there are dictators and autocrats and tyrants who disparage marginalized communities, but our communities also organize and rebel. And the Magonistas have also left us that legacy. We have a comment from William who says, thanks for a great presentation. Was there ever any communication or coordination between Mexican revolutionaries and Filipino revolutionaries who were engaged in the Philippine American war at the turn of the century? They also targeted US imperialism as a major threat. That's a good question. I am unaware of any direct communication or coordination, but that's a, Maybe there's a grad student out there who will look into that for us in the archives. That would be exciting to find. Yeah, right. Um, going back to what you were just talking about with the title of your book and, and talking about um, the horrific lynchings that were taking place, uh, was this, you know, we, we obviously think of the, the tragedy of African-American lynchings, uh, but, you know, can you talk a little bit more about how common this was and, and where it was talking taking place. You, you did mention your presentation, but any more context to this? Sure, well, I would recommend the website Refusing to Forget, which provides ample documentation and mapping of anti-Mexican lynchings, especially in the 1910s. But the records that we have show that around um, more than 500 Mexicans were lynched in the United States between the 1870s and the 1920s with high points being really the 1870s, 80s, and then again in the 1910s. Um, this is a far lower number than the number of African-Americans who, who were lynched, um, but it's, an, it's a notable and meaningful number in terms of the ways in which Mexican um, immigrants and Mexican-Americans were being incorporated and subjugated um, in the United States in those early decades after the US-Mexico War. It's part of what create a, a racial divide um, that would go on and endure across the 20th century. So um, I would strongly encourage people to check out Refusing to Forget. Um, it's a really important um, public resource for digging into this history and sharing it um, with others. Great. Um, Professor Aldana, who Dean Johnson mentioned, is a co-director of the Yoki Center, is a co-sponsor of this event, writes, thank you so much for your work. Your book does not spare Mexico from its own agency and profiting from U.S. empire building. Any thoughts on whether and how President Lopez Obrador, a self-proclaimed president of the poor, continues Diaz's legacy in the ways he engaged with Trump? Uh, and the way he engaged with Trump and now engages with Biden on immigration policy. Uh, that's a very hard question for historians because it's really set in the present. Uh, what I would say is one of the, the legacies here, the continuities here, is that um, AMLO declared 2022 to be the year of Ricardo Flores Magón and 2022 went on to be the deadliest year on record for journalists in Mexico. So Ricardo um, and these rebels began their career and their insurgency as rebel writers, as dissident journalists, and they eventually had to flee Mexico. Um, and we are seeing some continuities in terms of the danger and lethality of that occupation um, in Mexico. We have a message from Miriam who says, thank you so much for such a powerful presentation. You mentioned the role that women played by strategizing and carrying letters. Could you please say more about the role of women in the revolution? For instance, the role of Adelitas, if I said that correctly, thank you. 
Sure. Well, this book really focuses on the years before the, the outbreak of the fighting of the revolution. Um, and so uh, I really wanted to tell the story of women like Juana um, to bring them to uh, the public square. Uh, Juana is really important. Um, she is an extraordinary intellectual and writer in her own right. Um, she is an anarchist feminist who runs her own newspaper, Vesper, in Mexico City. Um, she comes north with the rebels in 1904. She's one of the rebels who comes north in 1904. But her and Ricardo have a very tense relationship that as Ricardo's reputation and power and influence is growing as a dissident, um, it's Juana who steps to him and says, you know, this revolution isn't about you as an individual. It's about a set of principles that we've laid out as anarchists and socialists and, and rebels. And Ricardo doesn't like that very much. And he does his best to undermine her, to publicly humiliate her as a rebel. And I'll let people read the story as to what happens there. Um, but Juan is not having it, and she returns to Mexico, and she continues to engage in revolutionary work, and as I noted, um, goes on to work with Emiliana Zapata, um, begins to um, intensify her work with indig indigenous communities and with women, and so she is one of the sort of longest-running revolutionaries um, from the pre-revolution period to the post-period. But this book also talks about others, um, other women like Maria um, Bousset, who didn't just give um, move correspondence, but she actually moved munitions as well, um, most likely um, into Mexico to attempt to uh, blow up the wall of a jail when some of the revolutionaries were being held there and other women. So one of the things I'm trying to do in this book is make sure that the role of women, which is not well um, archived um, is put at the center of this story. They are the glue of this, of this revolution. We have another question from our alum, Eduardo Diaz. Thank you uh, for your, your comments. Uh, would the professor comment on the link between the Monroe Doctrine and the US-Mexican War and later the Spanish-American War of 1898? Boy, those are some tough questions. Um, well, so one of the things that's going on here is the assertion of or the rise of U.S. claims to political dominance and protection across um, the Americas. And that ends up being a really interesting story here in the sense that when Teddy Roosevelt issues his Roosevelt corollary um, to the Monroe Doctrine, um, which is really the story of about the United States um, carrying the big stick across the Americas. Uh, Porfirio Diaz pushes back, actually. And he says, you know, I'm not going to carry your big stick. Um, I'm, we're trying to build power here across Latin America. And this becomes a sticking point in U.S.-Mexican um, relations in the early 20th century. And believe it or not, the Magonistas become um, the way that they they seek compromise. And in the end, Porfirio Diaz is experiencing so many um, problems, so much resistance um, from the Magonistas that he tells the United States, basically, if you shut down the Magonistas in the United States, protect my presidency, I will pick up your big stick and wield it across um, certainly Central America. Um, so that's how that discussion about the Monroe Doctrine and Roosevelt Corollary and more plays itself out in this story in particular. So as you were doing your research and archival research, what was the most surprising finding for you? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, there were a lot of thrilling findings, right? Every time you find a, a coded letter and there are dozens of them in the archive. It's thrilling to think about um, how much time the rebels put into crafting these letters um, and recrafting these letters and moving them um, amongst each other so that they could organize. So that's always a um, really intense moment to find that kind of frontline communication from a movement. Um, 
I think beyond that, one of the most interesting parts of writing this book for me was beginning to put the pieces of the story together in the sense that I had known about the Maguanista certainly since graduate school. And again, I, I learned about them in a Mexican history course. Um, and then I had continued to keep up with their story, but it always was in a corner somewhere. And in fact, as I was finishing this book, a sort of major um, scholar of Chicano studies said, oh, well, that's actually a small story. And I was like, no, it's not a small story. It actually sent, sits at the center of US history. And so to me, it was thrilling to begin to piece together how much the Magonistas were operating against major threads of, of US history um, or within those threads, white supremacy, imperialism, capitalism, and whatnot, and begin to, to pull it together and piece it together um, for a US audience. So making that pivot from the Mexican historiography to place the Magonistas at the center of the US story, that to me was just a really invigorating intellectual and, and political process. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. Uh, what do you have coming up next and uh, next project? Sure, I'm writing a history of the US-Mexico border, a very long history of the US-Mexico border from the 1820s um, to the present. And so I'm, I'm really excited about that book and thinking about ways that we can really turn upside down um, our contemporary understandings of what the border is and how it functions as a racial boundary. Okay. Great. Well, we want to thank you so much for your time and your fascinating uh, discussion and book and wish you the best of luck with what you're going to be doing in the future. And I'll uh, let Dean Johnson conclude for us. Thank you very much. Great presentation, uh, Professor Lido Hernandez, and I appreciate taking the time to, to talk to our community. As you probably could tell from the questions, uh, people were fascinated by your work and scholarship. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you all. Have a wonderful day. Okay.